Hey everybody, Mark here, and uh, today I was asked to broach a very specific topic, uh, the Boston Busing Riots. Uh, Ankai from Manic Expression, I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, asked me to take on that subject of the mid-70s Boston Busing Riots. And here's the thing, I don't know much about them. In fact, I know almost nothing about them other than they took place. I'm not really uh, an expert on the racial relations. Uh, I've read Whiteness of a Different Color. I've read... Um, this, Malcolm X's autobiography, excellent book. Uh, I recommend anybody who is interested in Malcolm X read this. And naturally it's told from his bias, but it is a great book. And, you know, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge about race relations. And even from personal experience, where I live, very few minorities, uh, I've, I've heard racist terms, of course, and I've seen a little bit of it here and there in my life, but I haven't really experienced a lot of segregated racism in western Nebraska where I live because you know there are few minorities and for the most part they blend in fairly well because there's very few so there's not really an issue there and so I don't I lack personal experience and I lack academic knowledge on this subject so I did what an academic does research and this is my Kindle clearly my Kindle and I read a book I read Ronald P. Formisano for well I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong I apologize Ronald P. Formis, F O R M I S A N O, Formisano. I'm not sure. He wrote a book called Boston Against Busing: Race, Class, Intensity in the 1960s and 70s. And so he, yeah, he literally wrote the book on it, right? So I read the book, and this was my research. I, I went online and looked up some other things. There was a little PBS uh, section on the Boston busing riots, and okay, so here's my perspective on it from what I can tell given my limited knowledge base, given what background I have, and given what I just read. Uh, in the North, and we're talking about the Northern United States, desegregation was a little bit harder than it was in the South. Now in the South there was resistance and you get the famous, you know, Alabama riots and all that sort of the, the you know, the bus um, boycotts and Martin Luther King Jr. But here's the thing, all those things were codified, right? They were law. It said if you were black, you went to this school. If you were white, you went to this school. You know, even if you know you lived here and you were very close to this white school, you still have to go to this black school. So you know, colleges, everything, they were all strictly white and black. And so it was easy to just go, okay, those laws are gone now. You, the University of Alabama, cannot keep out black students. You know, Little Rock High School cannot keep out black students. You have to let them go to your school. And it was resisted, and there was a lot of issues. And of course, it's a very famous civil rights episode. And you know, you can look more into the history that I have, or it's a little that history, but it was a little more cut and dry, believe it or not. And then in the North, though, the segregation that took place took place more out of sort of racial lines being drawn and, you know, and, and some shady real estate practices and things. So, you know, blacks lived here, whites lived here, and that was it. You know, the African-American community was separated by sort of a natural barrier between the two sides. So when the North went to desegregate, it was very murky. And Formisano points out in the Boston instance, there was another big problem. The, the desegregation uh, took place a lot in what was known as Southie and Charlestown, which were the poor parts of Boston. Boston, he, he talks about how it's boxed in and mostly the um, affluent people live outside of town. They live in the suburbs and outside of Boston, places like Braintree. I remember him bringing that up because that's where John Adams is from. That's why I remember Braintree, but so the poor people felt targeted by desegregation. So then you have the racism that had already naturally taken place in the separation, and then you have the, this feeling of being targeted. It was also a time of economic downturn in the 70s. So these two factors, economic downturn and the natural racism, led to some really ugly situations. And, and Formi Sano is clearly an economic historian. He spends a lot of time emphasizing the economic side of it and he really emphasizes what took place on the white side of it. He, he talks about Mel King a little bit who's one of the black leaders in Boston who pushes for um, the the desegregation who was working for it but he spends a lot more time on the uh, men like Kerrigan who are against the, bu the busing and and he points out how big a failure honestly the busing is it's it's sort of ridiculous what you end up with there's a lot of more white flight like it had been slowly happening, the, the whites had been leaving the inner city and it was just accelerated by the busing. So busing really fails to desegregate. And so the riots, doesn't make them justify. No, they were still wrong, they were still racist, they were still 
uh, taking their aggression out on the wrong people. And, and Judge Garrity, the, the person who, uh, Judge Garrity is the person who, who orders the desegregation. He's sort of left in charge of all this, all the busing. And he, he fumbles a few times. He, he makes some mistakes and he doesn't hammer down on those who he could have stopped maybe a little bit who were on that anti-busing side. And so, what's the perspective on all of this? What, what perspective can I give you? And the truth is very little, having little experience with it other than reading a very good book. I can recommend you read this book. It's not terribly long, it's pretty interesting, and if you are interested in Bos the Boston, Boston busing riots, this is a good book to read. So, what, what would I tell you in, in relation to this subject is that history is sometimes murky. And this is one of those instances. It's easy to pin down the anti-busters as racist fools who caused a lot of riots. Formisano goes about pointing out that there was some justification for their actions. Not the extreme nature of their actions, but their actions. And if there was a silver lining to the Boston busing riots, it was that, that people who followed them said, let's not do it like them. Uh, afterwards, Buffalo and uh, Denver and Columbus, Ohio all do busing and desegregation and do it a lot smoother because they, they don't make the same mistakes that Boston made. And but for me, it also points out the very uniquely Boston things about the Boston desegregation problems. So all in all, I, maybe I'm not the best person to be talking about this subject. It's not something I've studied extensively. I've read the, the one book now and watched a little bit of stuff on, P, on PPS documentary online and, and, and gone over it a little bit. My final thoughts on the subject are, are simply this. This was an ugly time in history. Desegregation, civil rights led to a lot of ugliness and the Boston busing riots were one of the really ugly things that came out of it. I, I hope that helps. Uh, I hope it answers Anne's questions. I hope it suffices for what she wanted and I uh, thank you and I hope that gives you a little historical perspective.